Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for being here tonight. We uh, do appreciate you coming and for the opportunity to talk to you about uh, Greatland and, and also uh, Red Rock. Um, my name is Gervais Heddle. I recently joined uh, Greatland Gold uh, as a uh, non-executive director. And this is Callum Baxter, who I'm sure many of you are very familiar with. And uh, yes, yeah, so we're going to just uh, both of us briefly talk a little bit about uh, the environment and Greatland Gold and why we're so excited to be uh, part of the story. And uh, then we're going to hopefully leave a little bit of time for questions and obviously we'll also be around at the end uh, to take any further questions that you do have. So this is just a few of the technical details uh, on the corporate structure. All this will be available on our website uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, and as you can see, I think the key thing to take away from here is that we've got uh, a couple of uh, strong shareholders supporting us, uh, Metal Tiger and uh, Starvest, and, uh, and also a lot of the people uh, associated with Metal Tiger, and, and also yourselves. And we'd like to thank you very much for all being here and for supporting us as shareholders, and we, we do appreciate it. Uh, also, uh, as you know, uh, Paul's wife has been buying a significant stake in the company, so I'm a little concerned that she's about to launch a hostile takeover <laughs> bid, uh, but <laughs> hopefully we'll be able to deal with that. Uh, this is the board of directors. Uh, obviously, many of you will know uh, Callum and Andrew, who are old hands here uh, on AIM and with Greatland. Uh, Callum was a founding director of Greatland and has been a steady hand on the company for many years now. And, uh, is, is, our, is really leading the charge in all our uh, geological work and the due diligence uh, that we're doing from a geological perspective. Um, Alex and Paul, uh, you'd also know from Metal Tiger, uh, and they've come in to help us with all their advice uh, and experience that they have. And finally, I joined the company uh, quite recently. So why are we excited about Greatland? Uh, well, as Paul says, we all believe as a management team that there is a great opportunity presenting it here, that we are near uh, at or near the bottom of the commodity cycle and that if you can find the right vehicles and establish positions in those vehicles, the right positions, that you can make a lot of money uh, as the cycle begins to turn. And we think Greatland is very interesting from a couple of perspectives. First of all, it has an interesting set of, a uh, very exciting set of uh, existing uh, properties and Callum's going to talk a little bit more about what we're doing there and obviously you've all seen the recent RSS announcements about uh, Bromus and also today about Ernest Giles and what we're doing there, planning to do. And he's going to talk a little bit more about that. The second leg is obviously that uh, Greatland Gold presents a very clean shell, if you like. It's a company that uh, hasn't embroiled itself in all sorts of problems and it's a very clean shell for us to go out and pursue external opportunities. We think there are a lot of uh, you know, companies with very depressed valuations in this sector and you know, we're looking to either acquire or joint venture or farm in those uh, opportunities as it makes uh, sense. We'll talk about what our criteria is there in a little moment. So just to put things in a bit of historical perspective, I know we all talk about the opportunity in the sector, but uh, I just wanted to present you with sort of my thoughts about you know, where it is. Uh, obviously, you've all seen this chart. This is the long-term gold price um, starting from 2000 which was sort of a long-term low for the gold price in US dollar terms. And, you know, gold's <coughs> rose from 300, you know, right up to, it was about 1950, I think it got up to, and then it's pulled back. And so there's been a lot of gloom and doom about gold and commodities generally, and oh, isn't this terrible? But in the long-term historical perspective, gold prices are clearly still much higher than they were at the beginning of this century. However, this hasn't been reflected in the stocks, and this is the Philadelphia Gold and Silver Index. And you can see that this index, if we cut off this chart at the end of last year, so only six months ago, this index was back at its lows that it was in 2000, 2001. So despite this huge increase in the gold price, going from $300 an ounce to you know, today $1260, $1300 an ounce, there was almost no return in the gold stock index uh, in the United States. And even with the recent bounce that you've seen in this index, this index is now still only back at 2004 levels, a time at which the gold price, if we go back to 2004, you know, the gold price was still around four or $500 an ounce. So the other way to see this is to look at a chart of gold relative to gold stocks. So this is the, this is the Philadelphia Gold and Silver Index divided by the gold prices. And as you can see, this is amazing because it's a long-term chart. I mean, this chart is going back to the early 1980s. And as you can see, there was a let me see if the red light works here. Is that it? Yes. There was a long-term trading range here between sort of 0.2 and 0.3, and that range was established for 
for many years. I mean, that's, uh, well, since 1980 to 2005, so that's, you know, 25 years that range held. And then with the GFC, you saw a sell-off in the stocks, as you would expect, but then they rallied back. But then post-GFC, those stocks continued to decline, to decline, decline relative to the commodity price. Even as the commodity price was falling, those stocks just got crushed. So you've got this amazing situation where you know, gold stocks relative to the underlying commodity have performed very poorly. And while we don't have the data to break this down for all the commodities and all the different commodity stocks, I think this is a similar experience that you've seen across um, you know, many of the commodities. Consequently, of course, you've seen the natural you know, supply response from the industry. When the equities get crushed, uh, you see expansion work dry up, you see exploratory work dry up, and, you know, people say, ah, oh, but there's still a lot of money being spent. But, you know, the headline numbers don't tell the, the whole story, even though, you know, head, there's been large headline reductions in capital expenditure. You know, you've seen massive, oh, sorry, you've seen massive reductions in the important part of that capital expenditure, which is this, which is the expansion expenditure, the expenditure that's being dedicated to opening new mines, expanding existing mines. Most of the expenditure that you see today is this maintenance capex, and that's got, has, is going, has gone up as people try to maintain mines and also maintain outputs, because grades in many of these commodities, as we know, the copper grades, et cetera, are falling. So anyway, so you've got this interesting setup where Valuations, you know, from a long-term historical perspective, valuations across the industry are very depressed. At the same time, you're getting the natural supply response with a decline in uh, investment spending, decline in exploration spending. And so you can really feel the industry setting it up for the next, you know, bull market here. You know, and our goal, obviously, is to take advantage of this and find the right entry points and the right vehicles where we can make money out of this. So in terms of the new opportunities, the new external opportunities that we're going to focus on, and as I said, Callum's going to talk about you know, the existing projects, but in terms of new external things, you know, our, idea, our ideal situation is to find a company who has spent a lot of time, a lot of energy, and a lot of money working up new targets, excellent new targets, you know, whatever that underlying commodity is, that we can get our hands on very cheaply. You know, for a simple, you know, maybe a little bit of cash up front, and then you know, whether it's a joint venture or farming agreement, uh, get our hands on this and then take these properties and work them, you know, properties where there's already been a lot of money spent, a lot of time spent. Obviously we have to be careful that we don't overreach ourselves and try to take on projects that are too ambitious um, and that we're within our know, management and technical expertise. But, you know, that's our, you know, that's our primary objective and, you know, fortunately we're in a strong position today with a good cash balance and also with a, strong, with a supportive shareholder base and, you know, we thank you all for, you know, being supportive shareholders and, um, you know, we're very excited about what the future holds there. Now, fortunately, there's not a lot of specific details that I can talk about tonight in terms of deals that we might do. Uh, some people have asked me about you know, whether we would stick to deals in Australia. We're looking at deals uh, across all geographies uh, and also across all commodities. Um, but uh, you know, we are cognizant, obviously, of you know, the geopolitical risks of getting too far out of our depth. And uh, you know, hopefully, stay tuned. There'll be a lot more to update in the near future. And we are, we do have a lot of projects under review. and. Uh, and there's some very exciting ones that have come our way. So with that, I'll pass over to Callum, who's going to talk to you more about uh, the developments at uh, Bromis and Ernest Giles. Thank you, Gervais. Um, that was an excellent summary of where we're at in terms of uh, the cyclical nature of gold. Many of you have obviously been investing for quite a few years. You've seen prices go up, prices go down, and looking at those graphs, it's an excellent summary of where we're at. Um, Sorry, my name's Callum Baxter. I'm Executive Director of Greatland Gold. And uh, I will be running through the existing projects that the company has. And um, during the past week or so, you may have noticed the RNS announcements the company's made on activities cracking off at a couple of the projects in Australia. Um, and again, it, We'll be here after the presentation to answer any questions you may have. So um, <coughs> please feel free to come up and have a chat. I'm always pleased to meet everyone. Again, we have a very supportive shareholder base, and I know that because I've been here for almost 10 years. Um, we've been carrying out mineral exploration activities throughout those 10 years and we've developed a set of very good targets and uh, the markets coming back to us. So we're moving into a much more proactive phase of drilling holes 
and really getting on with the job, which is what you want. That's why you invested your money in the company. First project, Bromus Nickel, which is located in Western Australia, down the bottom. And um, it's a nickel sulphide target where we've identified a large anomalies buried underground. And as announced earlier this week, we've commenced our pre-drilling groundwork and we'll be moving into an active drill phase very soon. When I say very soon, I mean in weeks. Um, we've identified four EM anomalies targeted for initial drilling there. I'll explain more about this further on. Uh, second project we have, also based in Western Australia, out here, Ernest Giles. It's gold primarily, also has nickel potential. We've been active there for four or five years and we've had some very highly encouraging results from our initial work at that location. We still have multiple targets to follow up and as announced in the past 24 hours, we'll be moving again into an active drill phase at that location as well. Thirdly and fourthly, here in Tasmania, we have our Fire Tower Gold Project and our Warrantina Gold Project. And you probably noticed, importantly, we own 100% of all those assets. So we're not earning in 20%, we're not earning in 50%, we haven't given away 49%, we still hold 100%. Moving into a bit more detail on Bromus, uh, we were looking at some recently released government airborne magnetics a number of years ago. We recognise this feature in here, which is effectively what appears to be at the time, we didn't know because it's buried under cover, but an ultramafic unit. And they primarily host nickel sulphide deposits. So we went through some historical geochemistry, which was in government databases, and lo and behold, we got some very serious indication that ultramafic rock is buried under there and very high nickel response at surface. So that was quite encouraging for us. The next phase for us was to complete a ground electromagnetic survey, which is here, um, the small loops here. And um, it was quite a detailed survey and um, we got some very good data from that survey which um, covered a, a significant area, four and a half kilometres of strike here. We covered four and a half kilometres of strike. And um, as the next slide will show, which is a bit technical, but um, it shows some very, very good bedrock conductors. Now, generally when you carry out a survey of this type, the geophysical crew will ring you up and say, sorry, nothing in the data. But in this instance, we got the telephone call to say, We've got some fantastic conductors here, Callum. And having worked in nickel sulphide exploration in the past, looking at this data, I was quite excited at the time. So effectively, what we're looking at here on the left is the ground magnetic response, and the, the whites and the reds is the ultramafic unit, which is the, the correct rock type that we want to see. And on the right here are the conductors. They're circled in yellow. So this high white blob here and this one here and these two to the south. This one in particular is a standout target. Um, in, in exploration you might see one of these every 10 years in your career so it's quite exciting for the company. From there we planned four drill holes, one into each of the targets. So these purple plates here are the drill hole locations. Um, they're quite a decent size so the indications are from our drilling program, if we get some all grade intercepts in the drilling, then um, that is extremely good. Even if we get lower indications of nickel in these conductors, that is also extremely good. We're going to be doing downhole EM here as well, which will give us a very good idea on the extent of the, the bodies that are buried underground. Moving on to the Ernest Giles Gold Project. We've had this for a number of years and as I mentioned earlier, we've carried out a couple of drill programs here. Now, a lot of people ask the question, why are we here? 
Well, there's probably nowhere on the planet that you can go these days and you can get a whole greenstone belt of prospective rocks that nobody's explored before. Um, in this instance, only one other company before us has explored before, Western Mining Corporation, and the potential is quite large. Down in the bottom left-hand side of this slide, um, greenstone belts are exposed and they've been explored for about 120 years and they've produced about 25 million ounces of gold. So they've, they've really done well. Here at Yamana, people have only been out there for about five to seven years and they've turned up with over six million ounces so far. Down here at Tropicana, exploration started about eight years ago and Anglo Gold have now got an operation of about eight million ounces. Virtually nobody's been here before. We're first movers and with a couple of drilling programs, we've managed to prove that there's greenstone there undercover. And we've also intersected gold mineralization. Initially over a thousand square kilometers with only six drill holes, we hit gold mineralization. And that is quite an achievement for an exploration company. And I think um, to some extent, we really haven't been given the credit for that, but it is early days and we realize we have to do more work. And recently the board's committed to another drill program at that location. So as we've announced in our RNS recently, we'll be moving into an active drill phase here at Ernest Giles also. This is our license location and our primary focus for the next drill target will be down here in the south where we've intersected gold mineralization previously. It's quite encouraging and it's really the start of something that could be very large and significant for the company. We've also identified a nickel sulphide target at Ernest Giles. I'll just go back a slide. Whoop. Not that many. We can see here in the north our Carnegie license with a bullseye feature in the middle. And this is our bullseye feature. And effectively it's a direct analogy to a deposit that was found in Western Australia relatively recently, which was recently sold to another company for one billion dollars. We've got the same rocks, same size, same tectonic location, or that is where it sits in the crust and uh, nobody's looked at it before. We drilled a first wildcat hole into this middle of last year and we got the right kind of rocks. So it, it's still early days for this target, but it's certainly something that um, we're keeping on the table uh, to test in the future. We also hold projects in Tasmania. Some of you may be familiar with Fire Tower License which was uh, under joint venture with an ASX listed company for a number of years. We've recently had 100% of this project returned to us and we're just continuing with low level activities on this license for the remainder of the year. Along with the Warrantina Gold project in Tasmania, some very good grades out of this one historically, over 100 grams per tonne in some of our work and uh, again an attractive asset that we'll move on with later in the year potentially. So in conclusion, we believe we're near the bottom of the cycle and we're actively seeking new opportunities to enhance what we already have in our portfolio. We're accelerating plans to exploit the assets that we have with the drill programs and at Bromus you can expect drilling to commence very soon. Currently our activities are fully funded with just under £900,000 in the bank. Thank you very much for your attention.